I had Logan Paul on my million. podcast. Would Logan do it with me? <laughs> Logan would kick your ass, I think. Mm. You're riding a fantastic wave. How could you not make some mistakes along the way? Think How can you be for small government and then have the government dictate all Thank these you. things in your personal life, exactly. right? You idiots. idiots. You got it completely wrong. Can't you just wake up and exactly. stop? Exactly. I was walking down the hallway like a dotted bull with a needle sticking out of my ass. Tell me the five steps to like, to the gate to the point where someone like you would say, I want this guy in my life. I want to help this guy. Hey, JB here. The Wolf of Wall Street in the Wolf's Den. Have a great episode for you today. Got a young entrepreneur, very successful in the online how-to space for business opportunities. Now, I want to pre-frame this training here, and really is a training because it gives you a lot of information here, but I want to explain that the biz op space can be a pretty sleazy space. It really can be, and I've shied away from it. So there's a reason why I have not gone out there and tried to make money because I can make a ton of money by saying, okay, hey guys, rather than teaching you the straight line to use uh, in your life and in your business to enhance your sales, to make more money, I'm going to actually sell you the straight line so you could then sell other people the straight line. Like you're in the business of selling the straight line. There's a very big difference between me saying to you, listen, I'm going to teach you the most important skill that you can ever master, which is the ability to close the deal. That's what the straight line system is. And I have a very robust advanced training that's diploma level that changes people's lives all over the world. That's the training. And when I go out there and I go online and I recommend it to people and I have my Facebook ads and my campaigns, right? I make X number of dollars for every dollar I spend on ads. However, if I were going to change my message from, I'm going to show you how to succeed as a salesperson, meaning you're making X, I'll show you how to make twice X, three X, and said to you instead, here's a new business idea. Forget your job, forget your life that's not working, forget the disempowered feeling you walk around with right now and your lack of certainty in the future. I want to show you a better way to make money. I want you to become a straight line certified coach or rep or this, where it's an opportunity to make money. I would make 10x. I would make 10 times as much money by framing what I do as a business opportunity. I want you to understand this distinction. It's a very, very important one. If I say to you, listen, I want to teach you a skill. So you're in sales right now. I'm going to show you how to sell more. You're an entrepreneur. I'll show you how to communicate better, raise money. I, that is worth X to people. As soon as you make it into a business opportunity, it's a solution that just by itself shows you how to make money. 10 times X. The problem is, is that my success rate with the straight line system is close to 100%. People that buy it, they all get massive value. Every last one, seriously. It's an effective training. It does what it's intended to do. It takes people and ramps up their closing rate, shortens their sales cycle, shows them how to get massive referrals. It just works. It's an amazing system. But when you're selling it as a business opportunity to sort of change your life by becoming X, Y, Z, guess what? 20% of the people will actually get success. So there's a lot of fraud. There's a lot of deceit that goes on in the business opportunity world. A lot of times people are counting on the fact that someone will buy something and they'll never even use it. You actually hear this person named Dan Henry, who's a wonderful guy, but a young guy, great guy, right? He actually talks about this. The reason I let Dan come on my show and I respect him is because he doesn't take that road. He takes the high road, which is the road less traveled for a lot of people in the biz op space. He actually speaks the truth about this and comes right out and tells people like, listen, you know, the chances are you're never going to use this stuff. Most people never open up the box, never take the training. They never take action. And if you don't take action, nothing is going to happen. So I respect that. I want him to come on the show because he does very, very well in the webinar space and he has a lot of good knowledge to offer you. 
So we have this really interesting interview, but what I really want you to focus on is he also does highlight this fact. He's like, absolutely, the business opportunity space is riddled with fraud, bad actors. And you know, he tells a story how he used my system to actually change his life. How he used the straight line system to become the top producing person in, I think he's sort of a direct TV he started at. And then he just tells a really good story. But the one thing I want you to focus on here is that these are not get rich quick schemes. These business opportunities, for the most part, they're bullshit. Just so happens that Dan has a very, very solid opportunity. And he does a very good job of educating people. Just remember, you don't ever want to get sucked into hype and bullshit. So I want you to listen to Dan. There's a lot of great information there for young entrepreneurs. He's an inspiring guy. He's a good talker. He says a lot of smart things. And he speaks a lot of truth too. So that's why I let him on the show. At first I was hesitant, like, I don't know, biz op thing, I don't want it on there. But when I really dug into what Dan was doing, I was impressed. So with that, we're gonna take a short break here and you'll hear a little bit about the straight line system. Then we'll go right to Dan and we'll rock and roll in the wolf's den. This is a perfect time now to take a brief pause here and I'm gonna give everybody here a gift. I'm gonna give everybody here free access to the introduction and the first training module to the formalized straight line certification program. This is a system that I sell for $5,000 here to individuals, to large corporations, medium-sized corporations as well, right? It's a very robust interactive training with quizzes and exams. It's ultimately a diploma-based course that changes people's lives. But I figure what I'll do, there's like 12 or 13 modules, but I'm gonna give everybody, and this is not one of those free things where I say, and you have to enter your credit card, and I hope you don't then forget to cancel. No, 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 I'm talking, I'm talking really free. I'm gonna just simply give you a link and you sign up for it and you get access to the introduction and the first training module, which is the five core elements of the straight line, cracking the code for sales and influence. This alone will change your existence. We're just understanding what has to go into getting someone to buy from you. And again, there's no obligation. You're not putting a credit card in. Um, you have to just enter your information here. And then after you're done, once you've gone through this, if you wanna keep going then, we can have a conversation about you picking up with the rest of the train, but this first part of it is free, my gift to you, all right? Let me give you the link. The link is jordanbelfort.com, simple, right? Slash bonus, B-O-N-U-S. So after you're done listening to this podcast, go to jordanbelfort.com slash, that's a forward slash bonus, B-O-N-U-S, and you'll be on a page, you enter your information, and that will give you access to this incredibly robust training. You can get the introduction and the first module, which includes the quizzes, the exercises. And I promise you that when you're done with this first module, you are going to be blown away. Here is a rule that I live by. If, an, if there are people that are willing to consume your information for free, then there is a percentage, a small percentage of those people that would be willing to pay for that same information in greater detail. And the thing about it is it only takes 1%. If a hundred people try to, you know, watch one of my webinars or, or opt into my funnel, maybe one to 2% buy, but here's the thing, it only takes 1% to become a millionaire. All right, so we got Mr. Dan Henry here, the man, the myth, the young legend. Already a legend, he's barely shaving, it looks like, but I think he's over 30, <laughs> but he looks like he could barely just learn to shave last week anyway. But yes, listen, why don't we, we were having a little conversation here right before the, we uh, decided to go live, and he was telling me a great story. Let's start right at the top. He was telling me that he, you are using the straight line system to do what? Tell me the story. So years ago, I, you know, I saw the, the movie Wolf of Wall Street and I was super, super inspired by it. And so I started looking you up and I was like, what, what is this straight line thing? And I, I was having trouble finding, you know, cause like I, 
I didn't have enough money to fly to wherever to attend a seminar. And so I found uh, it might have been an interview or something you did where you you had said the correct answer to sell me this pen was how long have you been in the market for a pen? And so I was like, wow, that's genius. So I was a salesperson. I was really young. I was in my early, early 20s. And I was a salesperson for DirecTV. And we did a home show where thousands of people were walking by the booth. And all of the other uh, reps were sitting there trying to convince people to buy DirecTV and they were taking an hour or so. And so I thought, well, wait a minute, I have an idea. And I thought about it from the straight line. So as people walked by, I just said, hey, did you forget to sign up for DirecTV? And they'd be like, what? I'm like, never mind, go on. And then I'd be like, did you forget to sign up for DirecTV? And they'd be like, huh? And eventually I'd get to a person who said, oh yeah, I meant to sign up last week, but I had to reschedule or I forgot about it. My wife's been on me. And I said, well, five minutes in and out, dude. And they're like, he's like, okay. And I made like 35 sales that day, broke the record, got to go to Atlanta, meet the vice president of DirecTV, uh, shattered the record for it. And it was just because I was just waiting for the people that were already ready to sign up. And I got that from the sell this pen. So it's really funny, that, by uh, the way. It's really funny. The funny part is that, is that there's so much truth in that whole strategy. Uh, which goes down to, by the way, I always say the biggest mistake that rookie salespeople make is they try to sell to people who don't want what they're selling. Right. It's like it's like the, the idea of, of straight line selling is like, you know, a lot of it has to do with prospecting and kind of sifting through a group of people, you know, who potentially might want what you have to get to the truth of who might want what you have, then only present right. to those people. Let me ask you a question though. So let's go back now a step. All right. You've had a lot of success in the online world. Right, you do a lot of um, you know digital marketing agency, how to coaching, right? So why don't you just give us a very give everybody who who doesn't know you, give us everyone the quick like a, a two minute recap of your life here, you know from the from the time you went into business, your failures, your success, but a short story. So to give everyone context. All right, super short story. Uh, all my life, I've been a serial entrepreneur. I had a lot of ups and downs, but never any big ups. And where I got the most ground was I did online marketing. You know, I would run ads for local businesses. And that got me out of a really bad hole I was in. And I was just starting to get back on my feet uh, where I could afford to get a decent amount of groceries. Uh, and so I was just starting to get back on my feet, but then I got a letter in the mail from the IRS that said I owed $250,000 in taxes. And that's because I didn't properly conduct business prior to that. I owned a couple bars. I never really did my P&Ls right. I didn't even really know what a P&L was. And I just didn't make good business decisions because I was young. So I'm faced with this, uh, this bill and I was doing well. I was making decent money at the time doing digital marketing. You know, I was doing five figures a month, but I didn't have no 250 grand. So I started looking up what's the fastest way to make the most money, you know, at the highest profit, the fastest, like right now. And I found that literally every online business that was doing that were all selling the same thing. They were selling information, either an online course, a coaching program, a mastermind, some sort of digital product. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I decided, well, I got to do that. So I studied everything I could and I, I gave it a shot. And in the first 30 days of being in business, we took a 997 offer, a thousand bucks. And on two webinars, two live webinars, I sold over a hundred copies, made a uh, hundred grand from doing that. And I thought, well, now I'm going to be able to pay off the, the bill. Well, what I didn't know was that there was a much more efficient way than going live and doing these live launches. And so I actually accidentally found that if I just automated the process, I could make more money. Uh, I took a break for 30 days, thought I would kind of give myself time to rest up and do another live launch. But in the meantime, I was running Facebook ads to a, a sales process that allowed them to buy the program automatically, not a live launch, and made more money doing that than I did the live launch. So I decided to make that my, my, the thing that I would become the best at. And from there, from there, I was able to scale up to $13 uh, million in sales for my own digital course. And I wrote a book, uh, won a bunch of awards, got invited to speak on stage, and it's just been really great ever since. Um, that's my story in a nutshell. Great. So, okay, so now, oh, you know, listen, that's a, it's a common story, but what makes it uncommon is I guess there's a, an extra zero onto your results. So I think the important thing, what you really, you know, cause I, cause, you know, there's a lot of people that go into that stuff, but most don't have that much success. They have some success, but there's something about the way you're going about doing things that's 
adding this zero onto the results. And I think that's the most important thing that people have to learn from you. Because again, like what you said is a very, come on, we've all heard that story many, many times. Sure. But what you don't hear is the, the, the level of success. What do you think it is that you're doing differently than the average person who has been in the same position as you that's read the same come on ads as you where like, you know, this is the place to do more, make more money as a digital marketing, blah, 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 blah. But yet somehow you're doing it and really succeeding at it in a way that's scalable. What's the difference? Well, like any good recipe, there are many ingredients that make it great. Uh, I could go into technical aspects, I could go into selling aspects, I could go into how I structure my offers, but I'll, I'll just boil it down to the three most important things. Number one is definitely your mindset. A lot of people think, and they get marketed to, as if this is easy, as if there's a secret formula, as if there's a system, a template. And the truth is, largely, yes, there are templates and there are systems that may work better than the other, but ultimately, this is hard. And this is not easy. To make millions of dollars from your laptop is not easy. It never has been easy. And anybody that tells you that it's just a simple system is completely full of crap. Right. And once you embrace that it is hard, now you've cut out 99% of your competition because your competition does not want to do the thing that's hard. Especially if it's like this make money online thing. Most people are just doing it to make a side, a side money. And if, if it doesn't work the first time, they just give up. So treating it as an art form and treating it as like playing guitar, like something that you continuously get better at and that is not easy is the first step. You must realize this is not hard and all those gurus out there that told you, or this is not easy and all those gurus out there that told you, oh, it's, it's easy, they are lying, that's not true. The reason I sell things to people to help them is because I've already done it and I say, hey, it is hard, that's why you need help. I'm not gonna lie to people and say this is easy, that's the first one. The second one is you must sell your information for a high ticket price. A lot of people try to make money by selling $47 courses, uh, you know, $97 courses, and they don't realize that they have the ability to sell information for a much higher premium and that it is much better to sell it over the phone than just on an order page somewhere. Because when you sell it on an order page somewhere, you just get any Tom, Dick, or Harry that comes in and buys your stuff. You don't know if they're a good fit. You don't know uh, who anything about them. And that's where you get a lot of headaches like refunds and chargebacks and people complaining. When you're able to provide a premium service for people and get them on the phone, get to know them, sell them that service, build that rapport with them on the phone, it, is, it's, it makes a much better situation for both you and your student and everybody gets more results the profit margin is higher. You're able to do better for your customer. So selling for a premium is also extremely important. And the third thing is validation. We set, when we try out a new offer, and this is what I teach all my people, you got to put ankle weights on. You can't just throw a funnel together, throw a sales sequence together, throw a webinar together, launch it and hope for the best. What we do is what's called a whiteboard webinar. We take a marker, we take a whiteboard and a cell phone. And if I can sell you my offer before it's created by saying, hey, we're filming it next week, you guys can watch the filming live, you can ask questions live, and then it'll be available as recordings to watch whenever you want, you know, attend live. If we can sell it to you first like that, without any slides, testimonials, without any student results, without any fancy countdown timers, nothing more than an iPhone, uh, a marker, and pen, that means that the offer itself is selling and your message is selling. And if you can make it sell doing that, then when you do put on the fancy funnels and the ads and all that, it'll really scale. But if it takes all that for you to make just a little bit of profit, it's gonna fall apart at scale. And that's why most people, even if they hit a million or two, they can't get past that because they didn't properly vet their offer by putting it in the worst possible situation and seeing if it will sell. So those are the three It's really um, funny, yeah, it's things. so funny because that's like, it's what you're saying is so, Fucking true. And I, I really, you know, so I didn't really know you, but I have a lot of respect for you because you're, you're speaking truth to my audience here. And like, what, what he's talking about, guys, for those of you from a different, I'll give you a different spin on this, is when I am doing something that's not working, 
let's say I try something, it, it, like, it just doesn't really work that well. And then my people say, well, but if we get the, the um, email sequence and retargeting sequence better, and if we get, I said, no, 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 you can't fucking tweak something into success. It has to work when it sucks. And then you make yes. this, it's one of my absolute paradigms yes. in business is Ugh. that when you have something that is good, it is so fucking easy, you can't help but make money. It's not like you, it's like it's barely working and you will get it 5%, but it's not what happens. Automation does not fix something that's broken. Automation makes something that's great even better. It's like that, it takes that last 10 or 15% and it squeezes out the, the juice, but you're not gonna take something that is not working when you try it and say, oh, I know what's wrong with it. We don't have the counter on. No, 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 the counter ain't fixing anything. No, no, you're, 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 we gotta have better retargeting. No, no, the retargeting emails don't, no, no, no. Either it works and it sucks, or it's never really gonna work. You could eke it out, and that's, I think, the biggest problem, is that, and getting back to this other idea that average sucks, and it's one of my famous quotes is, you know, being, you know, the enemy of great is good, and what happens is you can, you can tweak your way into being okay, but you're not gonna tweak your way into being great. In other words, it's gotta start off great. So that's really what you're saying, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. You, you, you're, you're doing all that fancy stuff to make to, to squeeze more sales out, not fix something that isn't working. It correct. has to work with Co no help. Right. Such profound advice for a young guys. So you're very lucky that you really, it took me many years, it took me even longer, because I got very lucky because you know when I, when I was young, my my early ideas worked so well that it took me a bit longer to actually have some ideas because until you really see it happen it's you know it's it's like really amazing when you actually try to tweak a shitty idea and how much you can spend in resources and frustration my my people work me they're amazed at how quickly i will discard an idea that's working okay i'm like guys it's never gonna be anything. It does, because so many ideas, an interesting thing, so many ideas, they seem great on paper. They make so much sense. But when you actually launch them, you don't get the result, like there's something off. And then every once in a while, like I'm just going through something right now, where I just made a pivot in my business and I was like, like the floodgates, the avalanche of money opened up after all these other pivots. Well, listen, you know, I'm failing making five or $10 million a year. And now I'm in a situation where after a pivot, I could make that in a week. That's because the idea itself is better. Right. It's always, in the end of the day, it's always about the, the idea. So here's the question, next question. How do you come, what is the commonalities in your industry for all the online people? And we could extrapolate it out to everything else, but in your world, what is it that makes an idea great? Is there some things like, do you have some sort of, in your mind, have you come up with what are the commonalities and what is it that makes most ideas suck moosecock, as I say, and why sometimes you see these ideas. I have a bunch of kids right now who I'm consulting for, wonderful young guys. They have a funnel. It's like the highest performing funnel I've ever seen, ever. Never seen anything like it. They're doing so well. But what is, in your mind, what are the commonalities that make something just rock and roll online? Well, you know, a lot of people uh, create these courses and these coaching programs and they're like, oh, we're going to help you feel fulfilled and live your best life. And we're going to help you, you know, attain a, a greater level of, of, of self-awareness. And, you know, we're going to help you just break through. And none of that means anything anything. It doesn't mean anything. What makes a product really truly sell and just beyond the funnels, beyond the ads, but even word of mouth, which is huge online, huge. I've made millions from people just recommending my products is having a QER, a quantifiable end result, which means if you buy this online course or this coaching program, you are likely to achieve a quantifiable outcome when it is over. Meaning, you know, if, if I have a program on, on how to lose weight with jump roping, then the idea is that you will be able to uh, lose weight from jump roping. That is a quantifiable end result. Or if you're saying, you know, I'm going to help you land your first real estate deal, it is your first real estate deal sign dotted. That is a quantifiable end result. If it's in the personal development niche, it could be save your marriage. It could be 
get your ex back. It could be increase your productivity. But to say these vague things like it'll, you know, it's going to help you live your best life. That doesn't mean squat. It means nothing. And people, unless you're Tony Robbins or somebody super famous, they can ride off that vagueness just because they have a known brand. Unless you're that, like me. you have to make a promise <laughs> and you have to fulfill. And it doesn't have to be big. A lot of people don't start online courses and coaching programs because they think, oh, I'm not an expert. I know people that have made millions off of courses on how to jump rope, how to use Microsoft Excel, how to train your dog. I actually, here's a funny story. I have a guy right now who bought my program to, to learn how to do this, right? He takes pictures of birds. He is an outdoor action photographer. He takes pictures of birds. And he sold a, a program before he ever created, he did that, that whiteboard webinar process I mentioned. In three days, he made 65 grand selling a course to people so that they could take better pictures of flying birds. It's okay? So, okay, so it's so funny. <laughs> so, like an example would be, I, did, I don't know if you know about this thing I did with a famous famous photographer named David Yarrow, who um, did a picture of, he does mostly outdoor, like wildlife photography. I mean, really serious shit, right? right? But he made his name actually doing stuff with like top models and wildlife together. He did a picture of me with the wolf, the real wolf of Wall Street, the wolf. Have you seen that picture? Oh, was it in a bar? Well, yes, yes, exactly. Okay. And it's one of, one of them actually got auctioned off at $250,000. One of these pictures. Wow. He had just is creating a course now to how to, of course, how to take pictures. In fact, I just, I got it today yeah. in my e inbox, right? A perfect example. He has a celebrity photographer. So very, so how would you go about that sort of course? Let's, let's design a course for my good friend, David Yarrow. So what, what's the secret to him scaling that course? Okay, so the very first thing, the bedrock, the absolute bedrock of what makes this work? Uh, it's the foundation. It's not the chandeliers. It's not the paint. It's not the stairs. It's not the walls. It's the foundation because you can have all those things, but if your foundation is weak, that crumbles. So the first thing is to create what I call an RMS, a refined marketing statement. So we must identify who you're helping, what you're helping them do, what major thing they think they believe they need to do that you can help them avoid, and the method in which you do it. Then we sell them the product that helps them execute the method. Let me walk you through that because that was, I know that was a lot in one, in one spot. So I help audience get desire without roadblock through method. Now we're not selling them a product yet. We're just getting them to believe a method. So let me give you an example. Let's just say that I was a speaker and I knew that I could make 10, 15, $20,000 speaking to a small group of 12, 15, 20 employees at a corporate training. And I was making way more money than most speakers who were auditioning for big stages. I could create a course where I help speakers create uh, or grow their, in, their speaking income without competing for big stages through niche corporate events. Now, in my marketing, I never try to sell them my product first. I sell them two things and in this particular order. First, I sell them the path, the way, the method which is I get them to believe that the best way to make money as a speaker is to go after corporate events where these companies, they have mandated budgets, they have to pay speakers, they have to train their employees, go after them because they're much easier to get, they have very little competition, and they'll actually pay you, whereas a big stage is just gonna let you do it for exposure. So first, I all my marketing revolves around making them believe that that is the new way to get what they want as a speaker. Then once they fully and utterly believe that, then I sell them the product or the coaching program or online course or whatever that helps them execute on that method. So the, the, the niche corporate speaker masterclass. Now, you know, when they believe that, they go, okay, well, what do I say? How do I negotiate it? How much do I charge? Where do I find them? That's what the course is for. So for instance, for, for your photographer friend, first we identify, are they going after new photographers? Are they going after existing photographers that need to make more money? Are they going after ex existing photographers that want to grow their influence and brand and, and be able to take pictures of celebrities. For instance, right off the top of my head, how any normal photographer can land A-list celebrity clients without having uh, an expensive agent. Bam, there is a piece of marketing for that. But, but again, that is if that was the exact market. Working photographers who want to land A-lister celebrity clients to shoot. That's the QER. You will land at the end of this program, you will land an A-list celebrity or you will be able to get a celebrity uh, or land, land someone famous 
uh, for a shoot. That would be the quantifiable end result. So you first have to pick who you're going for, what you're going to help them do, and what you're going to help them avoid. Because I would imagine that most photographers would have to have an in with an agent or something like that. Maybe he's got a secret of how he gets a hold of A-list celebrities and how he gets in. Maybe he does a free shoot or something like that. I don't know his business. But that's where you start to have to, to think about who, what, what they help avoid, and what the method is. And then he sells the product on how to execute on that method. Got it. So in other words, rather than trying to sell them a course with that, like in fo focusing on like what the particulars, the features of the course, what you're saying first is selling them on some alternative method for accomplishing an outcome. And then once you have them completely sold out, wow, that's a great niche market, so to speak. Then you're selling into that. You're creating demand for the, for the market first and then showing them right. how to do it. You don't, you don't compete, you create demand. You create your own demand. You stand in a class of your own, okay? You don't, you know, features uh, tell, benefits sell. You know, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you agree with that. I mean, that is an old, old adage. And the thing about it is, is that if you're selling commodities, then yes, you can compete. You can go on about features. But when you're selling an idea, when you're selling a movement, because that's what, it, what education is. Even to college, it's a movement. People don't go to school to learn how to be um, musicians because they just happen to want to make money as a musician. They go because they feel something in them that they believe that their place in life is music. You know, people... People go to learn things because they identify as that thing and they want to become that. Mm -hmm. And whether, you got to think, this is a, th in, by 2023, this is going to be a $325 billion industry. And the bottom line, the reason I do this is because our formal education system says, our, we program the youth of America today to spend 70, 80, 90, $100,000 on a college education, pay 20% annual recurring interest, get themselves knee deep in student debt before they even venture out into the world, all to wait four years to maybe, just maybe get a $50,000 a year job, but likely they'll end up working at Chili's instead. And that is not okay. And if our formal education system is not willing to raise the bar, then by God, I think we should do it ourselves. Mm. Got it. And do you think that, so uh, do you try to, in your mind, when you're selling your course, it's about helping someone monetize their passion? Is that what you're trying to do basically? Pick, pick your passion and I'll show you how to turn it into a, a course? Or is it more so, like, or if, let's say someone doesn't really know what they want to do. So my program, so my, my book and my program covers all of that. We take someone all the way from, I don't know what my course should be, and by the way, you don't need to actually be an expert. You can sell other people's knowledge, almost like a broker. Uh, there's a guy named Andrew Warner. He has a company called Mixergy. And basically, he interviews uh, famous business people or successful business people, and he sells access to the interviews. Uh, you, you look at the look at Masterclass. You know, masterclass.com. They do the same thing. They're not screenwriters. They're not famous sports heroes. They simply interview and get them to film classes, and they and they sell that. So the thing about it is, is we will take someone from, I don't know what my course should be, all the way to, we have people that have already made seven figures with an online course or coaching program, and they want extra help scaling. So we cover the, the complete gamut. We have a team to help beginners, advanced, uh, and I've really made it my passion uh, is to help people educate, because I believe that the biggest thing we are lacking right now, not just in this country, but in the world, is education. And it, it's too much red tape to get formal education to, to step it up. So I believe there's thousands of millions of people in the world that have knowledge that can improve other people's lives, even in a small way. And if you want to do your part to change the world, again, even in a small way, selling your knowledge is the, the way to do it. And so typically when you come up with, you, you talk about high ticket items, right? What do mm -hmm. you consider a high ticket item? Well, this is everybody considers this differently. It, in the in the world of digital products, I would consider anything low ticket to be you know two thousand dollars or under. Super low ticket is going to be like seven dollars, forty seven, ninety seven dollars. If you're picking up the phone to sell a program of the phone, you should at least be charging five thousand dollars. So I would say five to ten thousand dollars in that you know five ten even fifteen is sort of mid ticket uh, or, or is high ticket. 
Um, but super high ticket would be like thirty thousand. I, you know, a lot of people have like thirty to fifty thousand dollar masterminds. I don't get ca caught up in what it's called because some would consider a two thousand dollar program as low ticket, a ten thousand dollar program as mid ticket, and a thirty thousand as high, uh, as high ticket. I consider anything above five thousand as high ticket, just for the purposes of making it easy to discern whether or not you should pick up the phone. So essentially, if you're charging more than 5,000, you should pick up the phone and that's what we call high ticket. Got it. And below 5,000, you recommend that someone would just sell it online, not even bother picking up the phone? Well, up to 2,500, it's not very difficult to sell on an order page. You can sell it over the phone, but when you start getting into expanding and scaling and hiring sales reps, it's going to be very difficult to pay sales reps uh, a 10 or 15 or even 20% commission on a $2,000 product. You know, now if you got something that's five or 10,000, then you can pay them commission only and they can make tons of money. Uh, in between 2,500 and 5,000 is a very weird pricing area. It's a, it's an area where it's almost not worth it to get on the phone, but it's too high to sell over an order page. Some people can do it. It does happen, but it's that weird area where, you know, if, if I'm going to charge three, I might as well charge five, right? Because if somebody is on the phone and they say yes to three, they're going to say yes to five. So if anybody out there is charging $3,000 and selling over the phone, I just made you an extra $2,000 per sale. <laughs> just nice. charge five. Right. And in terms of, is there any specific, so who do you mostly, is there any like commonalities in terms of the industries that you're, that people are coming to you and, and building businesses off the back of your system? What, what do they typically do? Is it mostly oh. online sales and all, is there anything within the online information, anything that you're seeing again and again or? Yes. Yes. There, I mean, we have a very large, uh, variety. I have everything from make mo people that sell make money courses, real estate courses, all the way to one of my clients who does very well and sells a course on how to clean your desk. <laughs> I'm not kidding. Seven figure business, how to clean your desk. Um, but I would say, you know, real, real estate courses, all kinds of weight loss courses, personal development co courses, uh, uh, animal and dog training, parenting, um, uh, test taking, um, you know, I mean, really just the complete gamut. Yeah, there are a lot of business and make money courses because a lot of times when someone makes money online or just makes money in general, they tend to, you know, get asked a lot of questions on how they did it. Oh, I flipped five real estate properties last month. Well, how did you do it? And then you just start to get to thinking, well, man, if, if enough people are asking me how to do this, um, then obviously, you know, I, some people would be willing to pay for it. And actually, would you, I want to give a lot of value to your audience. Would you like me to teach them something in 30 seconds that could really tell sure. them right now if they have a viable business? Absolutely. Okay, so it. I call this the curious expert. So here's what you do. Think of something that you've done. Think of something, anything, or multiple things that you've done in your life that other people have been interested in, asked you advice for, what have you. Go on Facebook right now and make a post and say, hey everybody, as you know, for the past blank years, I've been doing this thing and I've achieved this. I thought about putting together maybe a free PDF or even a free video on how to do it. Would anybody be interested? Comment below. Now, let that post go out and see how many people comment. Here is a rule that I live by. If, an, if there are people that are willing to consume your information for free, then there is a percentage, a small percentage of those people that would be willing to pay for that same information in greater detail. And the thing about it is it only takes 1%. If 100 people try to, you know, watch one of my webinars or, or opt into my funnel, maybe 1% to 2% buy. But here's the thing. It only takes 1% to become a millionaire, all right? I, my first year in business, I was able to buy the house of my dream, dreams, the, this beautiful house on the water here in, in St. Pete, Florida, uh, 8,000 square foot house on the water. I was able to buy a multi-million dollar house, a nice car, uh, take vacations, do whatever I want, all on 1%. The, the clothes I wear, the, the going to, you know, good doctors for my son, nice timepieces if you're into that, 1%. It only takes 1%. So if people start responding to that post, you know that you have something that could eventually become a very profitable business very quickly. So is there any, okay, so 
someone puts a post on Facebook, how many comments should they expect? I guess it depends on how big your audience is, right? What, what kind of numbers are you expecting for someone to get back when they put that post up? Well, if you only have a small network of Facebook friends, then you're only going to get a few comments. What, what you're really looking for is if you don't get any comments, right? <laughs> so if you, you know, if you get just two or three, that's enough because if you got two or three, I would venture to say that if you had a bigger network, you'd get 20 or 30. And if you had a bigger uh -huh. network than that, you get 200 or 300. You know, if I post it, I'm going to get a hundred comments within 10 minutes. But when I was just starting out, I might've got five comments. So what right. you're really looking for is that you just don't want no one to comment. That's the thing you're really looking for. Do you think that anybody can do this? No, I don't. I think if you're lazy, if you're entitled, if you give up when something doesn't work the first, second, or even third time, if you can't accept that this takes work and refinement, and you view it as a get rich quick scheme, then no, it will not work. But if you are someone that takes joy in helping someone else, takes joy in helping someone achieve or learn something, because here's the thing, when you achieve something, right? When you make that first million or you lose that first hundred pounds or you win that first bodybuilding competition or whatever it is, you experience that first time high, but you only experience it once. But when you can take someone else who's never done it before, teach them and they achieve it, you get to experience that high all over again. And so for me, if you have that drive and that willingness to help others while at the same time the dedication to devote yourself to the business aspect of this and, and, and increasing skills and, and getting better at it and also investing in the tools you need, the help you need, the coaching you need, the, you know, the accountants you need, just all kinds of different things. I remember I didn't get a good accountant my first couple of years in business. I paid way too much in taxes. You know, you got to maintain that high level mindset throughout. If you are that type of person, then yes, you, anybody with that type of mindset can succeed. But if you don't have that mindset, I don't care how good you are at what you do. It's, it's not going to work out for you. What do you think about what percentage of the people that buy these types of programs actually go out and use them and make money? Is it a high well, percentage or a low percentage? And, and the ones that don't, What's the pro? I think we all know the problem with the ones that don't. They're lazy and they don't even ever try. But sure. what percentage of other people do do really implement this? You think? Not just with so, you. I mean, industry wide, would you say? Like in this whole, it's a really big space, right? And, and then I think you know, obviously there are some bad actors and and they don't really give a shit and they're just trying to make sure. money and they, they the courses suck. But what, for the ones that are like that are well intentioned, like you are, where you're actually giving value. What percentage of the people? actually go out there and make something of this? Well, Tony Robbins had a good statistic he released uh, a few years ago. I don't know how much he vetted this statistic, but it came from him. And he said that 70% of people that buy online courses, books, audiobooks, never open them. So right off the bat, you gotta, you gotta narrow it down to 30% immediately because those are the people that actually open it. So you can imagine the people that get success with it are extremely low, just like the amount of people that go to college are their success, I mean, how many people do you know that went to college for something, got a job for that exact thing they went to college for and excelled at that exact thing? Not very many. However, this is where we go back to charging a high ticket price. When you charge a high ticket price, people have more skin in the game. And so when I sell my stuff to people, not, not my book, my book is only a few dollars, but when, when I sell one of our coaching programs to somebody, they're paying a decent amount. And so they have more skin in the game as well. The more results you get, you got to remember, it's not, it's, it's, it's harder to get somebody to take action than it is to get their credit card number. So what we do in my program is every time we get a student result, we interview that student, we post it on our blog, we push it out to not only people interested in our programs, but our existing students, because I've literally had people come into my program that paid for it, went six months, did not take a single one single action, did not use it. And then all of a sudden they see an interview where somebody that maybe lived in their same city or did their same job or, or something uh, succeeded. And then they get fired up and they go and now take the action. Mm -hmm. And that's why that is important. We had a guy recently who's, who was a, a broke musician his whole life. He never thought he'd make any decent money. He was terrified that he would lose his job during this whole pandemic thing. And he was able to hit a $15,000 a month income 
quit his job during the pandemic and then somebody else in the program who was a musician who bought a year ago, a year ago, who never did anything, never came on the coaching calls, never did nothing, saw the interview and immediately took action, got inspired and made his first sale a week later. So I think that that number, while it's industry wide low, it really depends on how much, and this is key, how much the owner of the program cares after they already have the money. Right. That is the key. Okay. And, that is and the do, key. Do you, do you look at um, it as being important to be part of a community? Like for example, like I know you, um, you mentioned click funnels a couple of times, right? Mm -hmm. Do you, right. Look, do you look at click funnels as being a viable solution for people? You think it's a good way for people to start or are there better things out there? What do you think? So click funnels, right? All that software, these are tools. These are hammers. These are nails. Uh, what really matters is how you swing the tool. For landing pages, I do prefer click funnels. That's my favorite landing page software. But for email marketing, I use Active Campaign. Um, you know, and honestly, I used to use Infusionsoft, but I found a better way. You know, I don't really get tied down to. The I hate Infusionsoft. You know, I, I used to use Infusionsoft also. It's also oh, it's it's, it's horrible. Yeah, the yeah. only way you would use Infusionsoft is if you were a complete masochist. Yeah. That would be the only way. It's horrible. Um, and, and so you know, I, if I am using a, a yellow hammer for years, and I love my yellow hammer, and I'm swinging it, but for some, but one day somebody hands me a red hammer, and I'm like, I like the feel of this. That's not going to change how my house gets built, you know? Um, I, but yes, right now, that's my favorite yellow hammer is... is, 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 is I guess what I'm saying is there's like a whole culture around sure. that, about around ClickFunnels um, mm -hmm. with, uh, you know, events. And do you find that to be like a supportive environment for a young entrepreneur or more... Um, in other words, do you think it's good for someone to be engaged in that whole thing where they're meeting with other people in the industry or is it really more, let's just say not, it's really more, it's, it's more of a, of a it, they make it look like that's the solution to your problem versus you think it's really not the solution to your problem. Oh man. Do you understand you what I'm saying? Do <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So I've, I've been uh, uh, one of the more well-known names in that community. And while I love that community and I love the fact that Russell and all those guys have created such a great glue that holds everybody together. I try to make, remain balanced. If I go to events or whatever, I don't get too excited. I remember that the number one thing that's gonna grow your business is focus. And if you're out there meeting 10, 15 people a month because you wanna connect with other people in your community, I don't know how you're gonna get anything done. Um, so while I think the community is important, especially for, for any software or any, any brand community is important, but again, it's a tool you got to, you, you know, you use it when, when it's necessary and you, you wouldn't carry your hammer around all the time. Right. Right. So I do like that community. I do think it's helpful, but within that community, you have good apples and bad apples. You have people who have good advice and bad advice, just like anywhere. I think the important thing is to not get caught up in the hype and to remember that there is no magical force that is going to help you sell more. What you say, how well you, you hone your craft is going to make you sell more. And the other thing I will say is, and this is in a lot of events and, and, and company cultures, is this whole thing where people get up on stage and they give you an hour long speech about how being vulnerable in your marketing is the key or some crap like that. Or, you know, the, the secret is to be authentic. That's not advice. That's someone telling you to be yourself. That is not advice. Okay. Advice would be like, Hey, you know, when somebody says this, say this, when somebody <laughs> says that, that means this, you need to find the real objection. You need to get below it. That's real advice. Not, Oh, be authentic. So I think some people get way too hyped up about advice. That isn't really advice just because it feels good and it sounds good. And at the end of the day, you can make people feel good, but if your mortgage company comes calling, they're not going to be like, you know what? We were going to take away your house cause you're not making any money, but we decided not to cause we thought it might upset you. <laughs> Nobody is going to do that. So at yeah. the end of the day, this heart and soul stuff, yeah, yeah, it feels good, but guess what? It doesn't matter how much heart you have, how much soul you have, how, how, how many clicks you're in. If you suck at what you do, you're right. not going to make money. And that's yeah. that. So right. at the end of the day, you have to remember to stay balanced and know that at the end of the day, it's about getting better at the skills you have and getting better at your business and don't get too caught up in the, in the hype. 
So I know you study the straight line system, right? And and how in, in your mind, where is the tell me the distinction between marketing and sales in your mind? Okay, so my my answer is a little bit uh, different. I've heard a lot of different opinions on this. I believe you you could describe marketing as the thing that gets attention in order to get a prospect in the position to be sold to. And I believe that. But as well, I believe that marketing and sales can sort of have this intersect, right? Because it's, it's more than that, just that. It's when they get on a sales call with me or my team, you know, are they the right people? Did I, well, let me give you an example. If I, if I were to do this marketing thing and I were to be all hypey, right? And hey, you know, it's great, it's so easy. But then I sell you and you get into my program and you're like, whoa, this is actually kind of hard. This is not easy. You're gonna be disappointed. And you might ask for a refund or you may not take action. But if in the beginning, like in my marketing, I always tell people, listen, pick up your balls. This is hard. Okay. This is not easy. All right. We're, we're I, you know, we're going to hit this hard. And if you do something wrong, I'm going to tell you it sucks. This is why it sucks. This is how you can do it better. So for me, marketing is just not about getting people to a position where they can be sold. It's about getting the right people and not just that, framing their mind in preparation for the program, mm -hmm. getting them in under the right pretense so that when they get in, they actually get results. Right. So, but, but ultimately, I view all of that as one. I, I don't separate those two things in my company. I, I, everything almost is, is like a symbiotic relationship because I don't outsource my sales. I don't outsource my marketing. That's what we do. So for mm -hmm. me, it, it's all kind of like this circle that revolves around each other and it depends on each other. And we, you change something in one thing, it affects the other. It's not so separated that they can stand alone. If that, well, if that how much sense. do you, I mean, so I guess on some level, when you're marketing, you're also selling. <laughs> now, yes. The point is, is that I think the mistake people make is that they forget that marketing on the online market, well, you're basically selling on the page, so to speak, you know, through video, through prose, um, through all the things that you have, you know, like, you know, if you, if you know the straight line, sort of your loops are the same thing as like, you know, asking for the order, then keep talking, you know, you, you, know, you, you know, you have one call to action, then it keeps going and a call to action, it keeps going, right? I think the, the mistake that a lot of people make is they forget that, you know, in the end of the day, it's all really communication. You're trying to communicate something that you have essentially something of value that someone wants. So when you're going about doing this, how much of your marketing and sales is about the actual value proposition? Do you focus on, once you have, so I understand you, the first thing you're doing is you're finding essentially that, you know, that, that better way, so to speak, that niche way of doing stuff, right? How much are you mm -hmm. focusing on the value proposition of what you do? Do you dig into it on your stuff or you really don't, you know, when you're actually closing, how much of it is more the emotional side versus the intellectual side for you? Well, I, I think they both go hand in hand. Let me give you an example, right? Um, two objections, uh, you know, which I've, I've studied your stuff and, and ultimately when somebody makes an objection, their first two, three, four, five, six objections are not real objections. They're a facade. Right. Basically, they don't want to say, I'm not, I'm not certain, right? right? They, they, they just are afraid to say that. So for instance, um, if somebody were to say to me, well, you know what? I really like your stuff. Uh, I, I really want to do it, but I just don't have time. You see, earlier in that interaction, I would have asked them why they want to make money. Now, if they tell me that they say, well, you know what? My wife's always getting on my case because she's the breadwinner and we have four kids, two bedrooms for them. They, two of them have to share a bedroom. She's wanted me to buy a new house for a long time, blah, 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 blah. So now when he says, I don't have time, what I would say is something like, well, listen, how much do you care about getting that new house? How much do you care about making your wife happy? And, oh, I care a lot. I care a lot. You do care a lot. Yes. Okay. So you're saying that it's not that you don't have time because we make time for the things we care about. It's that you're saying you don't care enough, do you, know, do you care enough to make the time to do this? And then the other thing I might say is, let me ask you a question. It, again, you gotta read the person uh, on their attitude, but I, I, this one, this is a close I use all the time that works really well. I say, let me ask you a question. If, I, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, if you don't make time for this, or if you don't do this, it's gonna blow your brains all over the wall. Could you do it? Well, yeah, of course I could. Well, then I say, so what you're saying is you're fully capable of doing it, you just don't want to. Well, no, 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 that's not what I mean. Well, do you want to do this or not? Yeah, I want to do it. I want to do it. All right, well, then how can we make it happen for you? Let's get you started. You know, you gotta, they got to they understand that, that they're not articulating 
a lot of time their objection properly. They're, mm -hmm. they're not able to express themselves properly. So part of the sales process for me anyway is allowing them, because look, if you say, I don't want your product, I let you off the call immediately. Mm -hmm. Right. But so I I'm guess not what I'm saying is like, for instance, these objections, because you're right, you know, you're, you're obviously right. You've studied the straight line. You're 100% correct. And I think the, the point is, is how, my guess is, and my question is, is how at this point in your offer, you know, you know what they're going to say before they say, you know what the objections are. There's five, six, right. whatever they are, right? Are you actually seeding the answers into the actual presentation? So as you know what the five, six or seven things people say to you, what their concerns are. So in your marketing, you're actually answering those objections in your marketing and setting the stage then. You follow what I'm saying? That's what I was talking about. Are you going back a step yes. and selling in your marketing? That's my point. All the time. What right. we do every six months to one year is we do two things. We look at all of our sales calls and we send out what's called a didn't buy survey. We send out a survey to everybody that looked at our stuff but didn't buy. We get hundreds and hundreds of responses. We categorize those responses in terms of the frequency in which they occur. And then we redo our webinars, we redo our sales videos, all overcoming those objections. Right. So as people now get on the calls, and we do sell some stuff over sales pages, like we have some upsells to my book and stuff like that, but we bake in those things from our previous experience right. and that, over yeah. time it gets easier and easier if i were to try like this is the no, overlap I, when it comes in when you're actually right. selling in your marketing so they really tie into right. each other right awesome exactly so it's 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 where one ends the other begins and then when that ends the other begins and you just keep refining there's no way i could i could have multiple six or even seven figure months that i've had without the constant, the constant going back and refining the systems I have based on the input. That's huge. And then it, as well, it allows me to teach my team and on my sales calls, you know, uh, it allows me to look at better ways to answer these objections. Because what we find is people, people very rarely don't want the, the product. Once they go through all that marketing, and they get on the call, 99% of the time they want it. They're just, they're, they're just, because they're human beings, we're all human beings, we have a hard time separating with our money. And so on a sales call, my job is not necessarily to sell you, it's to allow you to understand if you really, really, truly want it. Because if you don't want it, fine, have a nice day. But if you do want it, you're not gonna get off that call without giving me some BS excuse like, I don't have time. Like, you do have time. You either, right. you either don't wanna do it, and that's why you're not making the time or you do want to do it and you just got to accept that. And so, you know, I don't ever want to sell something to somebody that doesn't want it because then when they get in the program, they're right. going to be a bad apple. They're not going to be happy, you know, and that's where that loop comes in. You just continuously get the marketing better, not just to sell people, but to make people understand what it is they're in for uh, uh, more. So that's, that's What's how I your it. next. Okay. So you're in your early thirties. You're doing really well, right? What's your next step up? Do you want to be a billionaire? No. Okay. What do you um, want? What do you want? I, th I think what's required to be a billionaire is far too much than I, far too, I don't want to have to do that. Like, I don't want to have to deal with all that much pressure. Even what I have now, there's a <laughs> lot of pressure. I mean, the more money you get, the more lawyers you need and the accountants you need. Guess and what? I got advisors. news for you. Guess what? Ready for this? There's a great book out there, which I, a, a fa I'm a fan of the author, a guy named Ben Mesrak, The Accidental Billionaires. Unfortunately, a lot of it ends up happening by accident. It's like when you're in the right industry, when you're in the right business, you know, models, right? It's almost like you can't help because it happens on its own. You don't plan on becoming a billionaire. It's really hard to plan being a billionaire. But I, I guess right. my question really is, is like, I mean, I think you seem, you're the type of guy that, you're not going to hold back your own scaling. If you saw the opportunity, you'd probably just scale it, right? I don't, I don't, it doesn't seem like your nature. I guess my, my point is, is that I think that your way of making money is awesome, but it's probably capped at yes. being, no, seriously, being at like being worth 50 million, 30 million. I, I don't know if it's quite scalable into the billions of dollars. And I just was wondering, cause you're a very sharp young guy. And, you know, some people would just like it. And, and it's like, it's, when I say a billionaire, it's a euphemism. It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's about going for the most of. That's what I mean. So the B is whatever it is it is, right? You know, when I was um, your age, 
it was like 100 million was a billion. Like if you were worth 100 million, you were a billionaire because like the Forbes 400 was all people worth 300 million, 400, you get it? They were like, it was like one billionaire. I think it was like, it was like, um, before Bill Gates, it was like uh, Adnan Khashoggi was like the richest man in the world, $3 billion, you know? So things have changed somewhat. So when I talk about you being a billion, what I'm saying is, could you imagine yourself using the skills that you have and trying to crack the code for this next level up would be a different version of the idea where, you know, you don't have to work any harder to be a billionaire. It's just, it's, there's no more work to it. It's really, mo in the same way you explained it, the same thing holds true for what you know to be true about making 50,000 or 100,000 or a million by overcharging for your, by not charging enough for your idea. And basically with a billionaire, it's just being in a bigger market in a bigger pond. It's not like you work harder. My question for you is, do you ever feel like that what's next thing? What's next? I wanna like just go to the next level. Well, no, you don't like that. It's not who you are. I do want to go to the next level, but here's one thing I realized about this. The cash flow in the education, the digital product business is amazing. I can clear net six figures a month all day long. I've been doing it for years, sure. but you cannot sell this. It's me. It's my face. It's Dan Henry. You can't, I can't, I can't go and try to sell my company. I can't do it. Nobody's going to buy it because the second I leave, it's worthless. However, I can take the cash because who, who, what are you going to use six figures a month in net profit for? What are you going to use it for? You know, what I do is I take that cash flow and I invest it into things that I don't need to be the star of the show for. For instance, I just bought a 12 unit apartment building here in downtown St. Pete from the cash flow from this business. I'm taking the cash flow from this business and using it to invest in things that I can sell. Uh, I, I invested a hundred grand into another, into this company that the startup. I can sell that because it has nothing to do with this. It has nothing to do with my face. So I take the cash flow from this and I invest it into things that can grow. Those old boring investments that have been around for years, right? That, you know, everybody says, uh, well, you know, in order to invest in this, you got to have, you know, like 200 grand. Uh, so it's, it's just out of reach. Well, okay, I'll send one email and I'll make 200 grand and then I'll invest in it. But I don't go under the, the, you know, the idea that I'm ever going to be able to take this business and turn it into, you know, a 50 million or a hundred million dollar thing, because that's just not how it works. It's extremely, extremely cash flow positive. Right. I get right. it. That's, the, that's, like, that's exactly what I'm yeah. saying. There's, there's a cap to this, you know, and you've, you've identified right. that. Right. And what happens right. is I'm just wondering, because you're a shop guy. And I think that, you know, if in the same way that you did it with this business, you could probably do it in a business that could be built and could grow into as big as you wanted it to do. Cause it's really, no, it's just, it's really the, as you said, it's, it, it's the model usually that's wrong. If, the, if it doesn't work on the, on the whiteboard, and it's not going to work by tweaking right. the same way a business that's not going to meant to scale is not going to scale no matter what you do to it, you know? Oh, absolutely. We, and, and, you know, the same principles do apply. I just, uh, that company is, that I mentioned that I invested in, it's a physical product company. We use the same principles that we use to sell online courses and that company's already doing very well. But again, that's a sellable asset. So I just, right. I try to look at things and know what their purpose is, what their limits are, and not try to push them past the limits just to inflate my ego. Like, I don't need, I'm not going to act like an idiot and be like, oh, I can make 50 billion or $50 million or $100 million selling online courses, you know, like, you know, like some of these guys out here who, who, who go nuts with that. It's not realistic, nor would I want to, you know how many, how much extra I would have to do. I'm comfortable where I'm at, you know? Got I'm it. comfortable making sure. what I make, inve keep investing in things, and eventually one day I'll be able to just turn, turn it off and say, hey guys, I'm gonna take a break for five years. I'm out, I'll see you guys later, and I'll have all these investments. And that's the thing, is knowing what you have, what it can do, and not trying to make, you know, make a, a, a round, uh, you know, a square peg fit in a round hole. Yep, good. How does someone find out more about, what's the Best way to learn your stuff. What's the first step for selling your book? Is there a web? What, what do you think someone should do that wants to know more about you and start learning what you teach? Well, um, when you're done reading uh, Way of the Wolf, uh, you can uh, you can grab my book. It's called Digital Millionaire Secrets: How I Built an Eight Figure Business Selling My Knowledge Online. You can get it at digitalmillionairesecrets.com. The book is actually free. You just have to pay for shipping and handling. Uh, you pay for shipping and handling. We'll send you the actual book out free. And then inside the book, uh, you can read it. And if you like the book, if it makes sense to you, if you feel like you can do this, there is uh, information in the book on how to book a call with my team to see if we can personally help you implement.
Perfect. Buddy, honestly, very impressed. You speak truth. I love it. I wish you great success going forward. Um, and love to have you back on one day for sure. Awesome. I would love to be back on. This has been great. I'm a huge fan. So thank you Thanks very much. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Everyone, Dan Henry, great guy here. Share this with your friends. This is definitely worth the price of admission here. It's a, it's a real interesting philosophy as, and uh, I think you guys should really take a close look at it. All right, everyone take care and good luck.